Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Yasudian, a consultant dermatologist based in the UK. Hair fall is a distressing condition as none of us want to lose our crowning glories. There's very good news, there seems to be a medication, oral minoxidil, that could be effective in treating it. Today we will look at the various hair conditions it has been used in, the potential problems and a practical strategy of optimizing the correct dose for each person. Minoxidil was first introduced in the 1970s as a treatment for severe hypertension. Increased hair growth or hypertrichosis was found to be common amongst its users and therefore a topical preparation, topical minoxidil, was first marketed in 1986. For several decades, minoxidil has been used as a 2% and 5% topical solution and more recently 5% foam has also been used in the treatment of a variety of alopecias. This review article from the Journal of the American Academy of Dermatology looks at the use of oral minoxidil in treating hair loss due to various underlying conditions. The encouraging message is that it seems to work for hair loss due to almost any underlying condition, whether it's scarring or non-scarring form of alopecia. The use of oral minoxidil for the treatment of hair loss has significantly increased for several reasons. Firstly, many patients find oral administration more convenient than topical application of a lotion or foam. Secondly, topical medication is operator dependent. That is, some parts of the scalp may be missed in those with widespread alopecia. Thirdly, it avoids the side effects associated with topical minoxidil, such as irritation and allergic contact dermatitis. Finally, oral minoxidil also may be more effective than topical applications. So let's look at a few hair conditions where oral minoxidil has been used. Female pattern hair thinning was the most studied condition. In the largest study, Rodriguez Barata and colleagues determined a mean dose of one milligram of oral minoxidil in 148 women to be an effective form of treatment. Response to therapy was more significant in patients with more advanced stages of the condition. Although a large portion of patients in this study were taking other treatments, little difference was noted in effectiveness between patients receiving minoxidil monotherapy and patients receiving minoxidil plus additional treatment. Therefore, it seems minoxidil actually works on its own. In a study from Australia, Sinclair and colleagues used a much lower dose, 0.25 mg minoxidil daily, along with spironolactone, 25 mg daily to reduce the risk of fluid retention. The combination reduced hair shedding and increased hair density throughout the one-year course of its treatment. This seems to be a very good compromise in those who would prefer to use low doses of medication. I have done a previous video on spironolactone for acne and I feel that this is an underused drug in dermatology. In male pattern androgenetic alopecia, Lenugrin and colleagues studied the use of a 5 mg daily dose. Measured over 24 weeks, photographs showed 100% improvement, with 43% of men having remarkable improvement. With longer duration of treatment, more patients showed a good response. Additionally, they found that oral minoxidil to be effective both in the vertex and in the frontal area, although the vertex showed greater progress. Jimenez Coahe et al. studied male androgenetic alopecia with a 5 mg or 2.5 mg daily dose. In a subgroup of patients treated with oral minoxidil monotherapy, mostly at 5 mg, all showed clinical improvement with 37.5% showing marked improvement. When using a lower dose of 0.25 mg, which was found to be effective in female pattern hair loss, another study found improvement or stabilization in only about 40-60% to of male patients treated for androgenetic alopecia. So the current data suggests that 2.5 to 5 mg daily doses are more effective in treating males with androgenetic alopecia. Alopecia areata is another condition that could benefit from oral minoxidil. This was a publication in the April 2022 issue of Clinical and Experimental Dermatology looking at the effectiveness of oral minoxidil in maintaining remission in alopecia areata. 24 patients were identified Initial alopecia areata remission was induced by topical, intralesional, and or systemic therapies plus systemic minoxidil. All agents except systemic minoxidil were then discontinued on achieving remission. Minoxidil dose ranged from 0.25 to 2.5 mg a day 
and included oral and sublingual doses. Treatment duration varied from 0.5 to 10 years. Based on previous data, the predicted alopecia areata relapse rate in this patient cohort was supposed to be 13 out of 24, which is about 54%, taking into account the disease chronicity. When oral minoxidil was used for maintenance, the relapse occurred only in four patients, which is 17%. Relapses were minor in three and significant in one. It therefore seems to be useful in maintaining remission in alopecia areata. It's also useful in chronic telogen effluvium. This retrospective study by Pereira and Sinclair utilized 0.25 to 2.5 milligrams of oral minoxidil daily for six months for the treatment of chronic telogen effluvium in 36 women. After treatment, mean hair shedding scores significantly improved in 31 subjects, which is 86%. The authors conclude that once daily oral minoxidil seems to reduce hair shedding in chronic telogen effluvium. There are reports of its effectiveness in scarring alopecia as well. A recent retrospective analysis by Vanco Galvin et al. suggested that oral minoxidil at a dose of 0.5 mg a day for women and 2.5 mg for men improved or maintained hair thickness in a majority of patients with classical lichen planopilaris and was especially beneficial for patients with diffuse lichen planopilaris. There are also reports of oral minoxidil therapy proving to be useful in treatment of loose anagen hair syndrome, monolithrix, and chemotherapy-induced alopecia. So how does it work? There are various mechanisms by which oral minoxidil may be effective. It has vasodilatory effect by upregulating vascular endothelial growth factor, which increases cutaneous blood flow with the resultant increase in oxygen and growth factor delivery to the hair follicle. In addition, minoxidil leads to hair follicle potassium channel activation, prolonging the hair cycle anagen or growing phase. Minoxidil may also have immunomodulatory effects by causing suppression of T-cells and therefore may be effective in autoimmune alopecias as well. Using all this information, let's look at a practical way of using oral minoxidil in hair loss. Based on the study of safety data, the authors of this article propose the following starting doses and titrating regimes for females. Start at a dose of 0.5 mg per day, followed by 0.25 mg increments every three months, depending on the response and tolerability, up to a maximum dose of 2.5 mg. Personally, following the Rodriguez Barat paper, I would start at 1 mg a day for women and titrate up. In males, we can start at a dose of 2.5 mg a day, followed by 1.25 mg increments every three months, depending on the response and tolerability, up to a maximum dose of 5 mg a day. Lower starting doses may need to be considered for those aged 12 to 17 years. Usually, about 6 months of treatment is required for any cosmetic response. With regards to duration of treatment, in patients with chronic hair loss conditions, low-dose oral minoxidil may need to be used indefinitely. Otherwise, any improvement in hair density may be lost within a few months of treatment discontinuation. What about safety? Oral minoxidil was generally well tolerated with only minor adverse effects reported in the literature. The most common adverse effect was increased fine hairs in the face or hypertrichosis, which is reported in about one-fifth of patients. Interestingly, hypertrichosis was almost never a cause for discontinuation of the medication because many of the patients considered it only a mild adverse effect and they could easily manage it. Hypertrichosis was associated with a mean dose of 1.4 mg in females and 4.1 mg in males. In practice, most use doses lower than this, so it's actually not a major issue. Cardiovascular adverse effects were rare and relatively minor. Blood pressure was monitored in some of the studies with only minor changes. Postural hypertension or dizziness was reported in approximately 2% of patients and lower limb edema was seen in approximately 3%, the majority of which were taking the 5 mg dosage. Headache was a rare side effect. The adverse effects reported developed in a time-dependent fashion. Whilst it reflects tachycardia and lightheadedness manifest early, usually within a week, headache occurred 2-3 to three weeks later, and finally, fluid retention, periorbital edema, and hypertrichosis had a more delayed onset, with a median latency period of 60 days. No serious or life-threatening adverse effects were reported, supporting its good safety profile for the treatment of hair loss. There are strategies by which we can treat each one of these side effects as well. 
For hypertrichosis, hair removal methods like shaving, plucking, bleaching, waxing, and lasers are useful. For lightheadedness, we can take oral minoxidil at bedtime. Also, getting up slowly from a lying or sitting position, increasing fluid intake, and adjustment of dose of antihypertensive by the general practitioner can help. For edema, limiting salt intake is useful. Diuretics like frusamide, which can be used in females and males, and spironolactone, which is usually in females, can be considered. For tachycardia, beta blockers are beneficial. If it is persistent, we may need to refer to the cardiologist. For headaches, simple analgesics like paracetamol and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are adequate. Rarely, if someone develops insomnia, sleep strategies, relaxation or sedative medication by the general practitioner is helpful. Overall, low dosage systemic minoxidil appears to be well tolerated and beneficial when used as long-term maintenance therapy for a wide range of hair conditions. Physicians could use oral minoxidil as an option for healthy young patients who are having difficulty with the topical formulation. The available literature suggests that women require lower doses from 0.5 to 2.5 milligrams daily, while men require higher doses for maximal efficacy, usually 1.25 to 5 milligrams a day. In addition to its therapeutic benefits, practical advantages of oral minoxidil include the five C's, convenience, cosmesis, comfort, cost, and compliance. I hope this information has been helpful for you. Thank you for listening and bye.